Good morning. Glad to have the handball choir with us this morning. Boy, that was a typical Florida rain shower, wasn't it? Just kind of snuck up on us. Y'all got in your car with no umbrella. The sun was out. You pulled into our parking lot and then buckets. Welcome to Florida. Could use rain. It's nice to see that, though. It's nice to see all of you here. For our online church family, I don't know if you're wet or dry, but we're glad that you're here uh, regardless, as we all have gathered this morning to worship the Lord together. want to give you just a, a couple of updates, uh, reminders of what's going on this week. This is going to be a wonderful week in the life of our church. Uh, first of all is our membership class immediately following our worship service today. We have signed up 24 people who are coming to the new members class, which is pretty great. Yeah, we love that. The room will seat about 30. So... <laughs> If we've got a few more people that want to come and just find out what it means to be a member of our church, we invite you to come. We're providing lunch. It's from 12 to 1.30, and we'll be, we'll be done and out by 1.30. And it's in a Crusaders classroom. If you don't know where that's at, you can go out these doors here, go straight across the alley into Cooper Hall, through Cooper Hall, classroom down at the end of the hallway. Uh, again, for all of those who are uh, interested in becoming a member or just looking for more information about that, even if you just come to the class you're not quite ready to, to sign on a dotted line and become a member. That's okay. But you'll, you'll figure out uh, more about who we are, what we believe, and kind of where we're going as a church. And we would love to have you be a part of that class. But we're really excited about that. 12 o'clock right after this service, new members. And then tomorrow night, Monday through Thursday, Vacation Bible School. For the first time in a, in a couple of years, we have Vacation Bible School for children who are entering kindergarten all the way up through those entering fifth grade. And uh, just real happy about all the people that have stepped forward, the volunteers to make that possible. We have a few more spots available. Uh, it's a bit late to sign up electronically and online, but what you can do is just talk to one of our uh, children's staff people at the end of the service. If you've got a, a child, a grandchild, maybe a child of a neighbor or somebody you know, they don't have a church home somewhere. That would be a great introduction to the, to the things of God this week in Vacation Bible School. It's going to be 6 to 8 o'clock in the evening. Monday through Thursday, just talk to our director of family ministries, our assistant director, uh, Polly in the nursery. Uh, after the service, you can just go over there and talk to one of the leaders in the nursery or the Sunday school room there. And we'll get you signed up because we do have just a, a handful more spaces left for Vacation Bible School. If you want to stay up to date on what's going on in our church, we do encourage you to keep visiting our website, follow us on Facebook, and if you're not on our email list, be sure to contact the church office to sign up for the updates. We do have worship bulletins every week for those of you that don't do the technology, but there's very limited space in those bulletins, and they don't talk about everything that's going on in the life of our church. And we want you to know that we're creating ministries and events and environments to help us all grow in our faith together, and just encourage you to take part of those as they fit where you are in life. Will you stand as you're able? We're going to begin our time of worship with a call to worship. Dave Hill is here again as our liturgist and is going to call us to this time of worship. Before I ask you to join me in our call to worship, I'd like to explain I'm here because George Skipper asked me to replace him this week, and George had a great excuse. His granddaughter in Nevada sent him an airplane ticket to go visit his 20th great-grandchild. So now will you join me in the call to worship, and it is responsive. This morning we gather at the edge of heaven, finding the gates flung wide open by the one who welcomes all. This, this morning we come to this holy place of worship, to be touched by the one who offers us grace and love. This morning we worship God, who adopts us into the family. To be filled by the one who would pour us out in service to the world. Good morning. Let's join in song together by singing number 451, Be Thou My Vision.
please join me now in the affirmation of faith, which is from 1 Timothy. And again, this is responsive. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer together, just a reminder that we do have prayer lists. They're printed in the worship bulletins every week. They're also emailed in our weekly uh, email that goes out on Thursdays to eBlast. Uh, one to add to that this morning, uh, if you would pray for Bobby Crosby. A lot of you know that name. Bobby has been here for a really long time and such an integral part of our church family. Uh, was helping me with the new members class here uh, after worship today, but Bobby is in the hospital. She's undergoing some tests. And uh, we just pray for healing and for great wisdom for the doctors who are looking out for her. But we send our love to Bobby and just ask you to pray for her this morning. Uh, join me in a, in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have here at, at First Methodist. We thank you for this church family, the people that you have called us uh, to be a family together. We've come from a variety of places. Father, you brought us from far and wide, different states, different stages in life, and yet here we are today. Uh, so many of us here in person, uh, some of our church family online who couldn't be with us in person this morning, but we are here as your family to say that we love you. We do that in what we sing and in how we hear and respond to your word and, and what we give with our, with our tithes and offerings and how we pray together. Father, we love you for all the good things that you have given us. We are mindful that in different stages and phases in our lives, uh, we need the prayer support of our church family. There are some who are sick and some who are dealing with disease, some who are uh, undergoing tests. Uh, their health is failing and they don't know why. And Father, we pray that you would uh, meet these persons at their point of need, that you would bring healing, uh, bring hope, and uh, bring wisdom to those who are caregivers and are trying to discern what's going on. Father, for those in our church family who are discouraged, who are lonely, who are hurting because of some brokenness in relationships, we, we pray for them too. Father, we know that is just the way that life is in the world around us, that we have those times and places where between parents and children, between best friends, something goes wrong. And we pray, Father, that as far as we can do, that we would work towards reconciliation, that we would offer forgiveness where it needs to be offered, and that we would receive forgiveness where that needs to happen. Help all of our relationships to be made whole. Help us to have a clear vision for the future of our own lives, of why you have put us here, what our purpose is, and how we can best serve you every day in this world. Father, we pray that our church would continue to serve this community faithfully, joyfully, <clears throat> ministering to the needs of all those who come our way. And uh, not just waiting for them to come our way, but getting out to meet them where they are. 
We pray that you would help us to become even more passionate about our mission of making disciples. You've given that mission to every church all around the world. But Father, we truly want to make disciples. We want to introduce people to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We want them to grow in that faith, to grow in their understanding, and to become more Christ-like in how they live their lives. We want that for ourselves. That's part of why we're here this morning as we worship you, because we want you to continue to transform us, change us from the inside out, that your values would become our values, that your character would be more and more reflected in our own character, and that the world would see Christ in us. All these things we pray in his name, as together we pray the Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Before we receive our tithes and offerings this morning, I invite Sandy Kuhn to come forward. Sandy's going to speak briefly about the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. We have been in partnership with the Florida United Methodist Children's Home for a long time, and it is a tremendous ministry. Every time there's a fifth Sunday of the month, we receive a special offering uh, for the Children's Home. It's not this Sunday, it's next Sunday, but we want to talk about it briefly so that you'll be prepared for that. And some people have asked the question, well, as our church looks like we're, we're realigning uh, later this fall from the United Methodist Church to the Global Methodist uh, Church, how does that affect some of our missions partnerships? It doesn't need to affect this partnership at all. We're going to remain Methodist, and this Florida United Methodist Children's Home is a tremendous ministry. They do a great work, and we're going to continue to sustain that support. And Sandy's going to tell you just a little bit about that ministry there so that you be prepared as the Lord leads you to bring an offering next Sunday. Sandy? Okay. Good morning. The, the children over at the home are out of school and they're having their summer fun. The his program is in full swing. They can be found in the pool, playing disc um, golf, riding bikes, or playing games in the gym. But these children all need our help. I'm going to tell you about one. Sarah is a young teen, and she was removed from her home due to abusive parents. Sarah came to us very untrusting view of adults and far behind in school. Through an evidence-based care approach with a great deal of support over the past several months, she has developed healthy and safe relationships with her house parents, therapists, and school staff. Sarah is now thriving as, at Legacy Scholars Academy and is planning to be active in um, the student government in the fall. Your investment in our children is life-changing. More than the next meal, you're providing these children with therapy, education, clothing, and other necessities for a happy and healthy life. You're also providing children like Sarah with hope, which is critical for their healing process. We are greatly appreciative of this congregation that just sent a recent gift of $1,520.65, which I think is very, very good. Your generosity is making an impact on the lives of our children. And thank you for your continued love, support, and prayers. The kids need us. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. If the Lord leads you to make a special offering to that ministry, that'll happen next Sunday. There'll be special envelopes in the pews. And for those of you online, you can, you can give it home. You just follow uh, the directions on the giving tab and designate that to the Florida United Methodist Children's Home, and we'll make sure that it gets, gets to that great ministry. But for now, uh, we are here to worship the Lord with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. These regular tithes, our ordinary uh, regular giving, the primary giving that goes to make sure that the mission of this church continues. And as always, we just thank you for your ongoing generosity. So many good things happening here. Oh, my goodness. Vacation Bible School this week. Potentially 24 new members next Sunday. God is moving in this church. And he's moving through you. Thank you for what you do. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, receive these gifts of our way of saying that we love you and we trust you. Continue to move through us, in us, among us. That we will more and more become your people following Christ wherever he leads us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
please remain standing as we sing our next hymn, number 724, On Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand. Before we read the scripture this morning, I'd like to invite, but I don't see any of them, children up through, okay. If your children are over there, or grandchildren, please don't forget to pick them up. The scripture this morning is Psalm 62 verses 1 through 8. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? But all of you throw me down this lean wall, this tottering fence. Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, 
for God is our refuge. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning we finish our worship series, a series that we've been considering ways that perhaps we need to become a little more countercultural in how we live. If we want to enjoy greater health in every way, emotional health, spiritual health, relational health, physical health, how do we need to do life differently perhaps so that we can increasingly align our lives with God's values and, and his desires and, and God's priorities for our lives? Well, we began this on January, or January, on July 2nd. If you were here on July 2nd, you heard me read a sampling of scriptures from the Gospels that showed how Jesus modeled for us the need sometimes to disconnect in order to connect. In order for us to connect with God at a deeper level, in order for us to connect with the people in our lives at a deeper level, sometimes we just need to disconnect from the noise of the world around us. We need to disconnect from the technology Disconnect from that always on, always connected, always available way of life because it distracts us. It can distract us from deepening our relationship with God and with other people. Then on Sunday, July 9th, we, we learn from Matthew chapter 5, it's part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and also from James chapter 1, we learn about the importance of avoiding outrage culture. If we're always looking for something to be angry about, we'll always be angry because there's always stuff out there to be angry about. We live in an extremely broken world, and it's inhabited by a lot of extremely broken people. So it's not hard to find stuff to be angry about. We don't need to go out there looking for it. We need to not engage in the outrage culture, but we need to be peacemakers instead, to be at peace and to be peacemakers. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry in spite of our culture that tries to form us into people who live the exact opposite ways, right? The culture would like us to be quick to speak, slow to listen, quick to become angry. No, that's the world's way. That's not the Jesus way. We need to avoid outrage culture. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Last Sunday, last week, if you were here, you heard our preacher talk about the, the difficulty but the necessity of, of making a stand and doing so wisely. Our culture is supposedly dominated by political correctness. You've heard that term a lot over the last couple of decades, political correctness. But the thing about it is, is it's not static. It changes all the time. And, it, and it's hard to keep up with what's politically correct today because what was correct yesterday isn't correct today and it won't be correct tomorrow. It just evolves and it morphs, uh, and it just seems to be getting quicker. You know, the, the outrage machine that is out there, the people who want us to be outraged all the time, what, what's out there, they, they target anyone who doesn't conform to their views. And it's made harder because their views are always changing, right? You feel that. And so because those views are always changing, because we can never feel like there's any stable ground to stand on, especially for those of us that believe that the truth is right here, uh, for Christians... Uh, we feel more and more marginalized and, and powerless because of what's going on out there. And so we, we need to recapture confidence in who we are and in what we believe. We need to stand up for God's values and priorities in the world that we live in. And we need to do that without running to the, the Christian ghetto, as some people have called it, kind of retreating within the walls of the church, uh, what we think are safe spaces, because no place is ultimately safe when we retreat. We need to stand firm. And we need to know what cultural battles the Lord is leading us into. Because none of us are called to engage in every topic, in every debate, every issue, everywhere. And that was the message from the Word of God last Sunday. It was loud and clear. And, and she did a great job with that. We don't need to have an opinion on everything. We don't need to express an opinion on everything. But we, we do need to know who we are and what we believe. And we need to stand for what is true and right. And we need to do so with great compassion and great love for everybody. Because we've got to remember that it's not just about being right. The goal isn't just to be right. The goal is about leading people to Jesus Christ and serving the world around us. So we're going to wrap this up today. And today's topic uh, is, is going to hit some of you hard 
a lot of you may be thinking, no, that's not me, that's, and, and maybe it's not, and that's great. But some of you, you're living, but you're not enjoying the life that God has given you. And I want to get into this topic by telling you the, a true story. And uh, the star of this story is Tattoo the Basset Hound. <laughs> I love Basset Hounds. Good-looking dogs. Story I got from the book, uh, The Life You've Always Wanted. Without going into a lot of details about Tattoo the Basset Hound, well, Tattoo the Basset Hound uh, one evening was out uh, for his regular evening walk. Tattoo did not intend to go for an evening run, but that's what happened when his owner shut his leash in the car door and took off for a drive. And so Tattoo did not have a choice but to go for an evening run. A motorcycle police officer, his name was Terry Filbert, noticed this passing vehicle and had something that appeared to be dragging behind it. And as he passed the vehicle, he saw Tattoo. Officer Filbert finally chased the car to a stop and, and Tattoo was rescued and he was okay. He was okay. I know you were looking for the worst case here. No, no, Tattoo's all right. He made it out okay. Uh, but not before they reached a speed of about 20, 30 miles an hour, and Tattoo rolled several times because of his leash caught in the door. Uh, the person that shares the story says at the end of it, is after that experience, Tattoo the Basset Hound didn't ask to go out for an evening walk for a really long time after that, as you can imagine. Well, today as we consider how some of us need to get a little more countercultural. I think it's safe to say that there is some tattoo behavior uh, going on in some people's lives. Again, it might not be you, but it might be the person sitting next to you. Tattoo behavior. Too many people out there who are spending their days going from one task to another task without slowing down, without taking a break, living at an unsustainable pace. Some people just have a hard time living balanced lives in, in such an unbalanced world because they've allowed the pace of their lives to get too fast. They're too busy, too much on their plate, overloaded with what some researchers, and there's a growing body of research about this, some researchers are calling this uh, in our culture the busyness syndrome. Some have taken to call it hurry sickness. I like that term better, hurry sickness. And it is in, endemic. And you see it in a lot of people's lives, if not your own, uh, maybe in your children or maybe in the lives of people that you love. A growing number of psychiatrists believe that there are a number of people, not all, but a number of people who are taking psychotropic medications, uh, think antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, simply because their plates are too full. There's too much going on all at once in their lives. And they're running themselves ragged from place to place. They're, they're trying to do everything they think they're supposed to do, everything uh, that the, the world tells them they're supposed to do to be successful in life. And they're getting run ragged. Economists have demonstrated over and over again that in work hours, in the United States in particular, work hours and stress keep rising the number of hours that, that we work each week, and the stress that, that goes along with that up. Sleep and family time are down, and this goes across all socioeconomic classes. Americans, by and large, work longer hours with fewer breaks and vacations than almost any other advanced society. You know, the, the workaholics among us, you know, we look at uh, places like France, or, or Germany, or Italy, or, or Norway, and we see you know, these people with like guaranteed four and five weeks vacations, and we, ha, but underneath our breaths, we, we, almost, we, we wish it was us, don't we? That we could have that much time off. And I see this pace of life problem a lot, this, this hurry sickness, this, this busyness syndrome. I see it in action a lot. Again, it's not, not everyone, but, but a lot of people. When they come and talk to me, I mean, as a pastor, people come and talk to me. They, they want to grow in their faith. Their hearts are in the right places. So we'll, we'll sit together over a cup of coffee. We'll have lunch or breakfast together. They'll, they'll come to the office. And they, they really, really want to follow Jesus Christ. They, they want to live this Jesus way of life that I, that I talk about all the time. They, they want to become the person that God created them to be. They really do. And so I, I talk to them about, you know, how to get there. How to, what's, what's the strategy to kind of get to become the person that, that God created you to be and, and what you want to be. And, you know, for so many people, where it starts is just by having a quiet time. 
And if you can't do that every day, just three or four, start with three or four days a week or five days a week. Just if, if you can't do an hour, do, do five minutes, do ten minutes. Just have a daily quiet time with the Lord. Uh, read a passage of Scripture. Think about it. Meditate on it. Reflect on it. And, and pray just, you know, a few minutes a day. And, and then find, find some place to get connected in the church, you know, a small group, Sunday school class, uh, or, or a ministry team to serve. Uh, so if you're doing life intentionally with other Christians, these are essential ways that we grow in our faith, right? A, a, a regular quiet time, getting connected in a discipleship group, a small group of some kind, serving in ministry just for a few hours a month. And, and you know what the most frequent response I get is? But I don't have the time. Pastor, I don't have the time. I, I just don't have the time. Pace of life issues are, are epidemic in our culture. Wayne Oates has written that most of us have taxi meters for brains and are ticking away, translating time and space into money. It is true that an out of control pace of life isn't everyone's problem. There are some understimulated people. I have also uh, met and I'm getting to know some retirees who aren't working, uh, and they're very understimulated. They're taking retirement quite seriously and they're growing bored at home and they could be contributing so much more to the kingdom of God. But that's a lot less common than those who are living an unsustainable pace in life. For many of us, we're just overloaded. We suffer from this, this hurry sickness. It's kind of like margin is a great way to look at that. Think of this paper. I've got some of my notes here, things I want to make sure I say. Okay, so I've got a piece of paper here, right? And what do you see around the, the outside of this piece of paper, all this white space? What, what do we call this white space around the paper? Margin, right? And, and you know, if you're you know, a high school student, you're taking notes in, in algebra or history or whatever, and sometimes you want to fill this thing up with margin. But, but if you're typing something up, if you're making a paper presentable, you want to have some margin. It makes it easier to read. And if you, you know, can take some notes on the side like that. But for a lot of people, they're, they're living their lives with no margin. It's like their, their lives are a sheet of paper that has no white space whatsoever. And, and what happens if you don't have any margin and something else wants to come onto the page? There's no room for it. There's absolutely no room in the margins for anything new, novel, an opportunity. Because our lives are too full. We live lives with no margin. And like one more thing gets added and... We can't handle it. There's just not enough margin in the lives of a, of a lot of people. Some people, I, I understand, have little choice about certain life decisions, the, the overload. I, I know people that have to work two jobs to make ends meet. That's sad, but that's reality for some. They've got to pay the bills. Some people have jobs that require a constant presence. They're always on. They're always on the phone, or the phone's kind of got to be there all the time. But most of us have more control over our time than we'd like to believe. Most of us do. It, it's just that we're so used to running at an unsustainable pace that we think it's normal. And we can't control it. So if you're having a hard time managing the pace of life and you'd like to find a solution, if you'd like to add some margin back into your life, if you feel like Tattoo the Basset Hound and you're tired of running and running and rolling, I want to offer you perhaps an unexpected idea to consider that, that might help you. It's an idea that some of you really need. You want to, for the sake of your emotional health, your relational, spiritual, physical health. You need to eliminate hurry is the thing. You need to eliminate hurry from your life. And, and how you can do that is by figuring out what it really is that the Lord wants you to do with your life and then do that. What is it that God wants you to do, that he's created you to do, he's called you to do right here and now in this season of life? Figure that out and let a lot of the other stuff just kind of dissipate and go away. It's different for everyone depending on their season of life. Some people, I mean, they're, they're called right now, you are called to be a mother and a wife, and that takes precedence over, over everything. Some people, you're, you're called to be a salesperson, and right now you've got to make this, okay, you've, you've got to do that. Some people, you're called, it, it's different. It, it's a phase of life, stage of life thing, and it's, and it's who God made you to be. Figure out why God created you, what God is calling you to do, and then just do that. When you figure out what your purpose in life is, this season of life, 
just everything else it enables it to just kind of fall away. All that other stuff you're chasing, all that other stuff the world says you need to be doing, you need to measure up to, live up to. I want to read to you just uh, some, a few words from Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33. This is Jesus. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that you don't have to overcome the world because Jesus has already overcome the world. Too many people killing themselves, sometimes literally, honestly, stressing themselves into a slow death with the higher blood pressure and the higher cholesterol, all those ugly things that stress brings to your life. Too many people uh, are killing themselves, literally or figuratively, trying to do as much as they can, trying to please everybody in their lives, trying to please their boss, trying to please the shareholders, trying to please the board, uh, their spouses, their, their kids. If they would just take the time to figure out what God wants them to do, why God has put them here. And then let a lot of the other things just kind of fall away. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What that tells us is that you can't save yourself. You can't work your way into God's good graces. Now, once again, I just want us to consider Jesus' way of life. Think about Jesus, his, his pace, his way of living, his, his, his pace of living. I, I read some of those scriptures on, on July 2. Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry, did he? You ever read where he ever seemed to be in a hurry? No. But he got a lot done, didn't he? He never seemed to have hurry sickness. He had margin in his daily living. In fact, some of his greatest teachings and miracles happened because he had margin in how he lived. It was that accidental encounter with someone who just happened to be there, the woman at the well. Right? Uh, many stories of Jesus able to do what God has called him to do because he had margin in his life. He was very intentional about his living, as best we can tell. Jesus learned his craft. He was a carpenter's son. His, his earthly father was a carpenter. Jesus would have learned that and have practiced that. He engaged people in conversations everywhere. He, he gave hope to the hopeless, healed the sick, he fulfilled his mission. And the key is he knew his mission. He didn't do everything. He didn't go everywhere. He didn't teach everything. He didn't heal everyone. He knew his mission. And he was obedient to it. He was very, very intentional about his living, right? And as followers of Jesus, we, we need to follow Christ on mission to the world. It means we need to know what our purpose is, what's our mission, our unique purpose purpose and calling in this world. Now, that doesn't mean that all of us are called to do what Jesus did. We're not all called to be, to be pastors. We don't want that. We're not all called to be pastors. Very few are. We're not all called to serve in, in nonprofit organizations, right? It might be for a few of us. Maybe your calling is to be the best teacher you can be. Maybe right now it's to be the best grandparent you can be and influence your grandchildren. Maybe it's to be the best salesperson, uh, electrician, whatever that may be. Be the best you can be. But you've got to know your purpose, Dave read for us Psalm 62 a little bit earlier. Those first two verses in Psalm 62 says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Now, does that reflect the state of your soul? Are you finding your rest in God? Are you not shaken? Or even stirred, shaken, not stirred? No. <laughs> Does that describe your life? Some of the early Native Americans in our country had a habit of stopping in the midst of a journey to rest a while. 
And uh, as they put it, and, and I can't remember where I read this, but they, they had to stop and rest for a while to let their soul catch up to their body. I, I like that phrasing. I like those words. Love that imagery. Let your soul catch up to your body. So what should you do? How does this apply to you if, if it applies to you? Well, if you're hearing this online, you're hearing this in person, and, and if you're here, you think you can't slow down, you think that it would actually be a burden to slow down, you think that it's impossible for you to eliminate activities from your calendar, well, let me, let me say this in love, uh, you're sick and you need help. <laughs> really, you, you have been so blinded by the ways of the world that says you have to do all these things in order to be successful. Every one of us could eliminate something from our lives, and our lives would be better for it. Every one of us. We're not slaves. You're not a slave to anybody. You are a person created in the image of God. Jesus, it says, has already overcome the world. You don't have to try to do that all by yourself. Jesus has overcome the world. You need to have a healthy pace of life, a sustainable pace of life, and, and not feel like Tattoo the Basset Hound, just running as long as your little legs can keep up because the moment you stumble, you're done. Right? How long do you think you can keep that pace up? The goal is to not become roadkill. Tattoo was rescued thanks to a police officer. The best way to eliminate hurry from your life is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Christ will, will help you to, to prioritize what is truly important and necessary. And it's based on who you are and your, your pace of life. And that's what I want us to pray about here. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you have overcome the world. You have already won all the battles that needed to be fought. And we look forward to that day when you will come back and finish the job. In the meanwhile, here we are. And we need guidance to understand who we are, who you have created us to be, what, what is our primary purpose in this season of life. Because if, if we don't listen to you, we're going to listen to some other voice. And there are a lot of voices that would really like to compete to tell us who we are and how we should live. And those other voices usually have an agenda. Your agenda is our health. Your agenda is our life and enjoyment of the beauty of the world that you've given us. Help us to hear your voice to tell us who we are and what we are called to do. And help us to be unafraid, Jesus, to eliminate some extra things from our calendars if that, if that needs to happen. Help us to focus on what's truly important, to eliminate hurry from our lives, so that we can actually enjoy the journey along the way. For the few among us who have the opposite problem, Lord Jesus, that just need a purpose and need to, to get up and do something, guide them to. Reveal to them as well why they are here, what their purpose is, how you have gifted them with, with skills and experiences that can be used for your kingdom. Help us all to move forward together as your family, as the body of Christ, at a sustainable pace so that we can minister and serve the world the way you've called us to do. As I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn.
Thanks for joining us today. We do invite you to come back next Sunday. Invite people that you know that don't have a church home to join you. Uh, let's worship the Lord together. We're, we're done with this series. We're going to go in a new direction. A big celebration of a vacation Bible school that's happening this week. And uh, we, we hope to have as many people here as we can to celebrate together. Uh, I'm going to disappear right after this. I've got to get over to the new members class for those of you who uh, have signed up for that. Again, straight through Cooper Hall into the classroom at the end of the hallway. It's called the Crusaders Classroom. Uh, if, if you're new to us today, welcome to our church family. Come back next Sunday. It'll give me a chance to actually greet you since i got to sneak away here this morning. i uh, love just to shake your hand and uh, introduce uh, yourself to me, me to you. Welcome you to our church family. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all this week. Amen. As you exit the building, uh, I'm going to be pulling these mics back, but the cords are on the floor, so if you're not very steady on your feet or you've got wheels with you, uh, be careful if you exit out the front. Mm -hmm.